Hi everybody, this is Joanne. The science of Botox is really the story of the age-old battle between pathogens and mankind both trying to survive here on the planet. It is also the story of science being able to discover how the pathogens act on the human body and then how we can take that information and use it to our benefit. Alright, you're going to watch a little tutorial with images and I'll check back with you at the very end. Clostridium botulinum versus Homo sapiens. The Clostridium genus has about a hundred species and most of us are familiar with the diseases of botulism and tetanus, but there's also other diseases that can be caused by this particular bacterium and one of them is gas gangrene and that's caused by Clostridium perfringens. There's also a type of colitis that is caused by uh, Clostridium difficile, but there are many, many more that we can look at. Now if you follow my arrow here, you'll see I am pointing here to a light microscope image of these bacteria and you can see they have an interesting uh, shape at the end. There is actually an inclusion here and we will talk about that. This is the Clostridium bacteria up close and again we can see that bulge at the end and this represents something. Um, these species are very interesting in that they die in the presence of oxygen so they're really only going to proliferate in an anaerobic state. So we call these bacteria anaerobic bacteria and that's important to remember. All Clostridia are gram positive bacilli and bacilli just helps us know what its shape is. So it's this rod shape that's here. Um, and the gram positive represents something about the uh, plasma membrane of the bacteria that it's able to pick up very specific stains. So here we're looking not at Clostridium but other types of bacilli um, in a smear from pus it looks like because we've got a lot of these other white blood cells in the area but they are purple stained and that means they are gram positive. For comparison, here are some gram negative cocci and that picks up the red stain and they're very small little balls as we can see here with the cocci. This micrometer, 10 micrometer line indicates that if something were about 10 microns in diameter, which a red blood cell would be, it would be about this big. So you can see that these bacteria are much smaller than that. First we're going to look at a cousin of Clostridium botulinum and that's the Clostridium tetani or tetany, however you care to say it. These are the ones that everyone warns you, don't step on a rusty nail, wear your shoes, otherwise you're going to get tetanus. And it's not so much that uh, rusty nails are in particular uh, where uh, tetanus likes to hang out, but it's pretty much uh, the fact that rusty nails have been out in the dirt. So the Clostridium species tends to be pretty much relegated to living in the soil and these nails probably have been in the soil. But what's much more interesting about this is the fact that nails when they enter your skin create a deep puncture wound which creates that anaerobic condition deep inside the body that allows the Clostridium bacteria to begin to grow. And what happens is you end up with tetanus or otherwise known as lock jaw and that's what this image over here on the right is showing that your muscles tense up so tightly it's called a spastic um, paralysis and you end up with this lock jaw uh, image but it also tenses up other muscles in your body and you end up with these tetanic spasms. Now this is a very famous painting of someone in end stage tetanus where they they're in a full body tetanic spasms you can also see this lock jaw here and what's happening is here is that the muscles are receiving so much neurotoxin from these bacteria and this toxin causes muscles to contract very hard and for a very long time and you're going to see that this is actually quite opposite of what happens in botulism good thing about tetanus is it can be prevented with vaccination and if you cut yourself you'll see when you go to the doctor you'll also get another shot and that's a little bit of the antitoxin and it is also further vaccination very important thing to do. Now we're going to look here before we look at botulism what makes Clostridium so special and what is so interesting about this tennis racket shape and this little inclusion here. Now these bacteria are not normally blue with an orange inclusion. These have been colorized. These bacteria have a very special way of surviving and the way they do that is to create this structure called an endospore and this endospore 
is very capable of surviving almost anything. These endospores are resistant to gamma and UV radiation. They are also um, able to survive extreme desiccation, extreme drying out. They can survive lysozyme, which is found in tears. They can also survive uh, extremes of temperature. Also, they can survive periods of starvation when there is no food for the bacteria to grow. And it's also very resistant to most disinfectants that we are used to using. So as you can see, these bacteria are very hardy. The, the endospores can last a very long time. So let's look closer at Clostridium botulinum. So Clostridium botulinum, again, is a soil-based bacteria. And since we grow our vegetables in soil, um, there's a chance that it could come to us through the food supply. And this is exactly what happens. Um, the toxin that these bacteria produce is very potent, but it is quite heat labile. So if you prepare your food properly before you can them, um, you, you can prevent uh, botulism from growing within uh, canned foods. But certain types of food, like mushrooms and beans, are uh, canned at a slightly higher pH than things like t tomatoes, for instance. And because then we create an anaerobic condition in the canning process, if you do not prepare these properly, there is a chance that these bacteria, given this area of no oxygen, are able to proliferate. So people who consume these uh, botulism-tainted um, items end up with severe gastrointestinal distress, as well as muscle weakness, um, blurred vision, difficulty breathing. And what happens with Clostridium botulinum with botulism is you, in the opposite of tetanus, you end up with what's called flaccid paralysis, meaning that your muscles get absolutely no signal at all. So your muscles just go limp and weak. And that's what happens. Now that we're able to understand uh, a little bit about this, we've been able to use the science for our benefit. First of all, let's talk a little bit about the botulism neurotoxin. Uh, and basically, one trillionth of your weight in botulism neurotoxin can kill you. That's not very much. Um, 500 grams of botulism neurotoxin could wipe out half the entire human population. 500 grams is about 100 nickels in weight. That's not very much. Then this makes it a very possible bioweapon. And because botulism toxin can be absorbed through the mucous membranes of the nose and the GI tract, the gastrointestinal tract, um, it could be spread through air and water and the food supply. Um, and that's all I'm going to say about its uses as a potential bioweapon. Just so you know, this is a very, very potent uh, neurotoxin.